Oh, it's the episode you've been waiting for, the 2021 My Guys episode. Three players from each of us going to be revealed on today's show. You do not want to miss it. Make sure you like, subscribe, and enjoy. Hungering for something new this summer? HelloFresh has got your back with pre-measured ingredients and easy-to-follow directions. Your new favorite meal can be prepared in under 30 minutes. Get up to 14 free meals, including free shipping, when you use code FOOTBALLERS14 at HelloFresh.com slash FOOTBALLERS14. Hey, what's up, everybody? Chase Edmonds, running back, Arizona Cardinals, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. It's football and my guy. It's so much stuff going on. Time. I don't have enough syllables. I don't we have do have football beats. tonight, don't we? We do. Two games. I'm excited. It's a big day. <laughs> Jason's nodding along. You needed a <laughs> bigger breath for that one. <laughs> it's football, my guy. Uh, wearing a hat time I'm, I'm gonna need a bigger breath friday august 20 at the fantasy footballers podcast on twitter at the ff ballers mike wright jason moore andy holloway <laughs> back with you a lot of energy at the table today it's my guy time it is my guy time today is the illustrious anticipated my guy episode of the show it's also the day after the day that I try to acquire my my guy in a dynasty league from Brooks. And How's that going? And fail. Mm. Is um, it is it done or is it still oh, just in limbo? It's super done because mm. I can't convince him to try to give me a counter. Perfect. I'm gonna ah. go send Brooks an offer. And no, it, it would be better for me if you didn't acquire my my guy <laughs> during the my guy episode, Mike. It would that would be an elite show. It would be an elite. <laughs> really, dang it. Entertainment value, yeah, Mike. emotional stability. I'm in. Let's go make our <laughs> offers. Let's go. Let's get them. Yeah. Well, I, you know what? <laughs> go for it. I've done all that I felt like I can do, and um, you know it, it. No matter how convincing you can be with an offer, at the end of the day, the other person has to be excited about the players that they're getting, even if the rankings or anything like that says that they're getting just such a great deal. They have to be excited about the players. Am I right? Yeah. I'm mean, not you wrong. Got, yes, you, you are. In a dynasty. Oh, you're here. I didn't know you're here today. Yeah, I'm here. Um, you still work here? <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Uh, it is Friday. Put Clan Friday. Every Friday, we give away a, an item. From pristine auction to a supporter over at jointhefoot.com. Today's winner is Nurse Nicholas. Nicholas! Wins an Allen Robinson signed mini helmet from pristineauction.com. Congratulations, Nurse Nicholas. And uh, if you are a nurse, thank you for what you do. Yes, right indeed. Now. Uh, Ballers is the code. You can use it at pristineauction.com to get a $10 credit and get some of your own memorabilia. Nurse Nicholas doesn't have to do that because. We just gave him. Still should, though. I mean, he, he, yeah. Like, I if you're going to sign up at Pristine Auction, use the code BALLERS, get 10. I mean, why not get 10 more dollars? <laughs> that's that's what my mama says. It does rhyme. So, my guy's on the way. Let's jump into the news. News and notes from around the league. Presented by Sleeper. I mean, big news was made last night because we gave away another ultimate draft kit for life. On a, a very entertaining live stream. Oh, very. oh, brother. And so we had a lot of fun with the Foot Clan yesterday. About four or 5,000 of you hanging out with us. Gave away a UDK for life. If you need help with your draft, definitely check out ultimatedraftkit.com. All right. Takeaways from the Patriots-Eagles game last night. I know the Patriots were there. Were the Eagles, did they end up? Busting in for the game? So, Jalen Hurts uh, came down with an illness. Um, Ooh, apparently, ah, yeah, it was it was pretty severe. Um, he, it was not it was not COVID, but he he took himself and the rest of the Eagles out of this lineup. Oh. So, 
Uh, Joe Flacco got the start and um, had his life tried to be taken from him uh, mm -hmm. on a tackle from behind. Uh, I, here's my biggest takeaway. If you are into DFS uh, in the preseason, uh, plug in Ramondre Stevenson for Seriously. the preseason games. Yeah, Damian Harris had a score at the end of that turnover uh, drive, and then you know Devonta Smith played, and our injury expert Matthew Betts said that there was nothing that he thought was alarming about you know the, I guess the injury or or anything he saw in his gait. And to me, super small sample, of course. That's what the preseason is, but he looked already like he's the best wide receiver on the team. Pick the right team to go to to, yeah. to look the best. Uh, Mark Andrews. Scared some people yesterday. Yes. There was news about him, you know, being carted off the field and then an ambulance showing up, but apparently it was a severe bout of cramping. It was very humid where they were practicing. You don't, you know, you hear these stories about overheating a lot with like high school athletes or right. college athletes. You know, the NFL has a pretty relaxed practice schedule, but um, Mark Andrews dealt with some of that. I guess he's, I guess he's fine. That's great. It was, that was a little, jarring to come into that twitter feed yeah uh, jason avoided all the the fear part of it because yeah. he was not I, in the office at that moment and that probably having just traded for him in our oh dynasty man league. if i had heard i i didn't hear the news about the ambulance and the carting off until after uh it came out that he and was your, okay your story was just oh hey mark andrews is okay right and i was like, like what was what? wrong with mark andrews <laughs> but if i was oh man i would not have been here for today's show did it give you a, a sneak peek at like the level of tilt that we opt into every year though with injuries and fantasy football yeah why do we do this <laughs> every year we're destroyed uh deandre swift returned to practice on thursday he had been out a couple weeks with a groin injury so i imagine he's going to Emerge from groinindex.com. Oh, yeah. He will be removed from groinindex.com. Yeah, you graduate. Oh, I like that. <laughs> he graduated uh, with a degree in healthy groin. And um, the nice thing is he, he went right into a heavy workload. Everything seemed fine. So I think they really uh, were careful with this one, tried to make sure that they didn't rush him back. And it gives me a little bit more confidence in Swift going forward. A.J. Brown hasn't been participating in joint practices. Uh, not a disclosed injury, but he hasn't been out there, which is interesting. you got to keep your eyes on that. And Cortland Sutton, he said he will play in one of the remaining preseason games. Okay. His quote was, we're still talking about it. So, okay. You're running out of time. Talk yeah, about it. I was and yelling, I'm running out of confidence. Yep. I was I was uh doing my best job to yell and scream over text to Matthew Betts, our injury expert. I wanted I they demanded mm. um answers about this recovery timeline because I, I feel like yes, you know, he's he's back, he's he's practicing, he's playing. They're saying he's going to hopefully play in one of the preseason games. Um but it, it is very concerning to me because there's not just a physical problem. There's the mental problem um, when it comes to recovering from an injury like this. Are you confident in the knee? And I, I know that there was a, a beat reporter who was sharing about how there was a, a great opportunity for a deep ball, a uh, really nice ball by Locke, and then Corlin Sutton couldn't run under it and just mm. just didn't and then Tim Patrick kind of took him aside and said you know you'll get there and and that's good I, I you know he will but he's not there right now and well, that's concerning and how would you feel right now with you know if Amari Cooper was coming off of a severe knee injury and you have waiting in the wings CeeDee Lamb well in Denver you have a very you know a, right a solid rookie season from a player that didn't have a lot of catchable passes in Jerry Judy so there is um you know, there's the chance that during that acclimation or reacclimation to the field that Judy grabs a hold of of kind of an alpha role there, isn't there? There is. It's it's uh it's one of the most difficult situations for me when it comes to my rankings because I was pretty bullish on Cortland Sutton earlier and now it it's a question because um if he gets better and becomes the one at the end of the year that's at the expense of Judy if Judy steps up and takes over the one it's at, at the expense of Sutton and so at the end of this year we'll look back and say it was Tim Patrick again <laughs> that well, guy. you know what you're probably right yeah. 
Tim just Patrick doesn't is have an good. exciting Maybe. enough name. It seems like Hamler might be in front of Tim oh, Patrick. I, I though. like I like Hamler too. Man, get this team a quarterback. Yes. That was today's news and notes brought to you by Sleeper, the largest dynasty platform out there. So check them out. And I mean, we're here. Oh yeah. The time is now. Any any uh second thoughts on what's about to happen? Any I've just changed all three. Oh, I'm excited to see your new my guys. I thought you were going to say you just changed your pants. You're like you're just very afraid to reveal. I have done that five times today. Okay, let's do it. Nothing you can take can tear me away from my guy. Oh, it's just that graphic is yeah, it's it's top notch. It's a little disturbing. <laughs> All right, we are. Into the My Guys for 2021. We have been doing a My Guy show since 2015, back when Mike's My Guys were Travis Kelsey before it was cool, mm -hmm. Carson Palmer before he was really cool for mm -hmm. fantasy, and Allen Robinson. That was that was his breakout year. That was back in 2015. While I appreciate the DAP, I also do not appreciate that level of pressure. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, as long as they deliver like uh, Travis Kelsey, Allen Robinson, and Carson Palmer, you're fine. Uh, should I go first? Who should go first? Here? You're up, Dad. Let's go. Let's have it. Well, I because it's age before beauty. That's right. So my first my guy, and we put it, this was fun this year. We had a lot of fun on socials. Um, we were trying to see if people could guess them, which was revealing in and of itself, right? Like of players that you know. The Foot Clan, the listenership, associate us with. And you listen to the show. It's very clear because you were spot on on a number of players. And so this was the most common one that was guessed for myself. It's also, I'm sure, guessed for, for Jason often. We are both all in on the value of your first My Guy. Let's have it. It's Tom Riddle. <laughs> Tom Brady himself is my first My Guy this year. You have an extensive Tom Brady resume to look back on. Uh, you d it's not a small sample. No, no, it isn't. But, you know, the story last year, this was a team that, you know, they won the Super Bowl, but you forget how, like, much of a struggle it was over the first half of the year. They were 7-5 and five going into the, the Week 13 bye, and Tom Brady whipped this team into shape. I mean, they averaged 33.8 points per game, for the next eight games, won the Super Bowl. Uh, they just took a huge step forward. It was everything that, you know, getting rid of Jameis Winston and bringing in Tom Brady could have been for the team. And age is just a number. I said it on the Tips and Tricks show. I am all in on Tom Brady because I think he is the, the best combination of upside, fantasy point ability for your, for your team and draft price like the price you have to pay to get Tom Brady onto your team uh is not the same as the other elite ranked quarterbacks he's still a motivated very motivated quarterback on on Tampa Bay 1100 yards away from ta passing Drew Brees for the all-time yardage record from week seven on last year this is the quarterback six but his pace was ridiculous he was on pace for 5200 yards 44 touchdowns and when you look at the signs and signals of a player that's declining at the quarterback position, you don't generally find a player that was number three overall in 20-plus yard completions. He had 63 of them last year. Number four overall in 40-plus yard completions. Number one in air yards per attempt in all of football. So, Oh, Bruce Arians, thank you. Yeah, it really, yeah. it's nice to see that the narratives around Bruce Arians' offense still fit with Tom Brady where like Bruce can't handle his quarterback, not chucking it and Tom Brady's happy to do it. And then when you look at the wide receiver room and you see Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Antonio Brown, yeah. you had Scotty Miller open down the field. And so it's just an elite offense, elite offensive line. Um, you're going to get a few sneak touchdowns from Tom Brady and I wanted to look back at Bruce Arians year two historically as well, because that was part of the narrative. It can be a bumpy road in year one, but what's happened. He's had four different teams that he's been a part of, which one of these I completely forgot back in 2002, he was with Cleveland. 
They made the playoffs in year two with Bruce Arians with Tim Couch at quarterback. In year two in Pittsburgh, they won the Super Bowl with Big Ben. It was a huge step forward once they got on the same page. Arizona in 2015, that's when Carson Palmer went bananas. That was the year yep. where Mike had him as a my guy. He was first in yards per attempt. And then we've got year two for Tom Brady in Tampa Bay, and everything's in, ahead of him. So, you know, he's obviously not going to do it forever. But I think he's going to do it for one more year, and he's the perfect combination of elite upside and elite draft value. He's, yeah. a, he's a my guy. I don't know if it's fair to say he's obviously not going to do it forever. That's that's assuming Remains you, to be human seen. law, yeah. um, which I don't think applies here. I mean, the reality is you might be worried about Mike Evans or Chris Godwin or Antonio Brown or Gronk, or you might say, well, there's just – you know, we talked about the yeah, three wide receivers. Right, exactly. Man, I forgot it, to mention Gronk. It can't work out for all of them, and so I'm going to bypass this player or that player, but they all go for Brady. So, uh, yeah, I love it. I'm going to go next because we're going to go from old to young. We're going from Tom Brady to my first my guy, C.D. Lamb. Okay. Oh, brother, hot and bothered. I make notes at the end of every NFL season. You know, we have our uh, 10 Things to Remember episode, and I wrote down a note in my binder this last year, and it said, quote... In your trapper keeper? In my trapper keeper. It's a five star. Um, <laughs> it said, quote, be all in on C.D. Lamb and T. Higgins next year. This was leaving the season. I wanted to remind myself how great they were on the field. And these two had kind of different off seasons. One team drafted a top five NFL pick at wide receiver, and the other team had Amari Cooper uh, pretty much go gone right. for their entire offseason program and is getting Dak Prescott back. And I think Justin Jefferson, his outstanding rookie year, really has masked just how great CeeDee Lamb was. He already has been phenomenal. He's one of seven rookies with 70 receptions and 900 receiving yards over the last decade. That list is Keenan Allen, Odell Beckham, Amari Cooper, Michael Thomas, Justin Jefferson, and then Kelvin Benjamin's in there as well. And outside of him... <laughs> Kelvin Benjamin's rookie year was awesome. He was he was great with Cam, but uh, this is a list of of true dominant wide receiver ones, guys who smoked the league. Not just like oh, these are decent wide receivers. He's in elite company, and that was with Andy Dalton and Ben DiNucci for the majority of the season. Now he's getting Dak back, and if you look, obviously Dak his pace, those numbers are outlandish. We know that's not fair to extrapolate. But it is worth at least noting that his rookie pace was 93 receptions, 1,385 yards, and six touchdowns. He already had a connection with Dak in year one. And Dak is a huge reason for my CD love because every single year there are multiple teams that have multiple wide receivers in the top 12. It happens every single year. Last year, both Minnesota and Seattle had two top 12 wide receivers. The year before, it was Tampa Bay. The year before that was Pittsburgh and the Rams every year. Well, this year, it's Amari Cooper and C.D. Lamb. They're both going to be top 12 guys. Dak is going to be great. But the reason I'm so bullish on C.D. Lamb is because true alpha wide receivers just demand targets and they make the most out of it. This is not an analytics-based argument. I mean, there's plenty here to base it. I just, I just published and wrote a huge article on the success rate of second-year breakout players. You can look at that at fantasyfootballers.com. All the analytics are in that for C.D. But that is not my reason he is a my guy. He is a my guy this year because sometimes we just don't want to overthink it. I made this mistake with DK Metcalf last year. He is a true alpha. I think CeeDee Lamb's one of the best wide receivers in the NFL already. He has no weaknesses. He's still getting better. He's a great route runner. He's a great yards after the catch guy. He's a playmaker, big splash fantasy plays. He's a great contested catch guy. And Great wide receivers just demand the ball and do something with it. There's a reason Hopkins gets 160 targets every year. It's not because he's the only guy. It's because he's great. There's a reason Devontae Adams gets every goal line targets because he's awesome with it. And at the end of the day, I think CeeDee Lamb is going to demand the ball. They're moving him around in camp. Every camp report talks about how he's the most dominant playmaker out there. And next year, he's going to be far more expensive than he is this year. I'm confident in that. So this is the only time you get a value on C.D. Lamb. Who's coming with me? 
Well, I, you know I'm coming with you. He was my fire guy on the fire episode. I completely agree. You want players in fantasy that can win you your league. You don't you know you, you don't want to be third. You want to be first. He can go out and he has he's one of the few players that has the potential to be a top five wide receiver. That's what you're asking for. So I I'm all in. I'm with you on that. I'll I'll come along for the ride. All right. Would you like uh, do you want yeah, me to you go? Know what? Uh yeah, why don't you? Why don't you give us your first my guy? All right. Bef uh, before we thank today's sponsors. Yes. Let's thank my first my guy and let me paint a picture for you. Come on down. Let me paint a picture Wait, for you. Is he here? He might be. That oh, be man. Cool. That would be, be really cool. cool. I've sent out enough heart signals to him over the off season, But here is the picture that I want to paint. A couple years, of back, uh, a couple years ago, we had a, a second-round wide receiver. He was highly questioned. He's 6'4", 229 pounds. But he had 129 speed score, which a speed score, that's not just your 40. That's your 40 adjusted for how, how tall and, and how much you weigh. Essentially saying this player is elite fast for his size. But can he play the wide receiver role? Can he run good routes? Well, what did he do as a rookie? He was a top 24 wide receiver five times, put up 58 for 907 touchdowns. That player is now a consensus top 10, probably a top five dynasty wide receiver that was dk metcalf just two years ago so let's look at last year same scenario we're in the draft a second round pick 6'4 238 pounds 125 speed score what are we saying we have an elite gigantic athlete but can he play wide receiver a lot of a lot of chatter in the draft process this guy should just switch to tight end give it up you're never going to be a good wide receiver and what did we get we got a top 24 wide receiver six times as a rookie, 62 receptions for 873 yards and nine receiving touchdowns. And that is my guy, Chase Claypool. That, their story and their production as a rookie is so crazy similar, it's, it is ridiculous. It, like I said, his rookie year, in his first 10 games, Chase Claypool was a wide receiver three or better seven times, and that includes being a top 12 wide receiver four times and he wasn't even a starter until week three much like Justin Jefferson Chase Claypool was eased in I get it the production the efficiency kind of fell apart there at the end of the season but you know what was there the volume he was still seeing seven targets a game and there's a lot of chatter is Big Ben done is he washed people said he was washed last year meanwhile he was on pace for for over 4,300 yards and 37 touchdowns. He was willing his way to production at the quarterback position. And the team is all in on Big Ben and this offense. They're going for a Super Bowl this year. And Jason, I, I'm glad you were talking about they They demand targets. True number one wide receivers demand targets. Chase Claypool saw a target every 4.24 routes that he ran. That's demanding a target more often on a route than Tyreek Hill, than Terry McLaurin. In fact, that was best among all the rookie wide receivers, including Justin Jefferson, Ayuk, CeeDee Lamb. When Chase Claypool was out there running routes, he demanded a target because he is not just a great wide receiver, he is an elite-level athlete. And I think that Chase Claypool can easily take that, that jump, become a number one guy, I, I, this is not an anti-Deontay Johnson take, so do not hear what I am not saying. I think that Deontay is a great PPR guy, but Chase Claypool, like Deontay is not going to take the leap to being a DK Metcalf style of player. Double-digit touchdown where player. Chase, it, it, since the year 2000, rookie wide receivers with 10 or more total touchdowns. Odell Beckham Jr., Mike Williams, Mike Evans, Calvin Ridley, Tyreek Hill, Chase Claypool. What's his draft? Best. What's his draft cost right now? Currently going in the sixth round, sometimes in the fifth round. But this is a a receiver that I believe can break out, and I have him in my top twenty. But the sky is the limit to me for what Chase Claypool could become, presuming that he gets uh, he he gets on the field a little bit more. He just he is. If you were building a wider a breakout wide if, receiver, if you were building physically a wide receiver one for your team. You would make Mapletron. <laughs> you um, just pour, pour him out of the bottle. And, and construct a breakout wide receiver in year two. Uh, all right, so first, the first three my guys are now revealed. Let's pause for a second. Let's thank Fandle for supporting the show today. 
New FanDuel Fantasy players, your day's about to get 20% better. Start playing fantasy this football season. Get primed. Get ready. FanDuel will give you a 20% bonus on your first deposit. That's up to 500 smackaroos. Smackaroonies. Uh, or as we say, a BTB, a big oh. time bonus. And all you have to do to claim it is make your first deposit on FanDuel. Tons of different game formats. You know, you get the opportunity. that We talk about so many players all off season, and you get your favorites, but you're not going to get them all on your on your you know season long roster. You can have them week to week and and root for them and cheer for them. And you know, you got main slate and single game and best ball and snake drafts and you know all of the different game formats that you can enjoy. Experience season long wins without season long waits is what you can do there. Sign up today at fanduel.com slash FFF to claim your bonus and start playing today. That's fanduel.com slash FFF age and location restrictions do apply. Bonus issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires after 30 days. And Foot Clan, we know what you want. You want football and not just a game or two. You want all of them and you want them live. But Maybe you can't get DirecTV where you live. Oh, no. Well, no problem, Mike, because you can stream the 2021 NFL Sunday ticket on your favorite devices. No satellite required. It's like having front row seats to every live out-of-market game every Sunday afternoon. NFL Sunday Ticket TV. It lets you follow your favorite team no matter where you live. Watch every out-of-market NFL game every Sunday afternoon live on your favorite devices. You can see the shortcuts, see the 30-minute replays. You can have a play tracker. You can follow up to 20 of your favorite players using the NFL Sunday Ticket app. You can do a customizable game mix and watch four games at once. It is a really cool thing, and you can do it by going online to nflsundayticket.tv slash Ready. Right now to see if you are eligible. Pro tip, use the promo code BALLERS2021 at checkout and save 15%. Again, to see if you're eligible for the NFL Sunday ticket streaming package, go to nflsundayticket.tv slash sundayready and use code BALLERS2021 to save 15% when you sign up. Shall we move forward? Shallant we? <laughs> Shallant. Shallant? I love it. I like um, shallants. They're delicious. All three of my my guys this year can be had after the eighth round oh. of fantasy football drafts. And the last two... Discount drafting. Yeah, the last two my guys that I have today are both after the 10th round. And so my, my second my guy... Look, timing is everything. You ever heard that, you know? Timing yeah. is everything. Sometimes mm -hmm. things just need to come together in the right time. Sometimes you could be a little early. A little late. Mm -hmm. Ty timing is everything. Like how you wrote him on the board before me. <laughs> Tyler Higby, Rams tight end, is my second. My guy. He's had him on the board forever. No, I, I, know, my point is that I love this guy, and I completely agree. He's, he's a phenomenal target and a great my guy. Yes, the Higbeast himself. Look, I was completely out on him last year. I spent the entire off season. Pushing back against breakout hopes for Tyler Higby. I didn't believe that the season end trend where he was like the tight end one, five, three, nine, one, he mm. ended that year. I didn't think it was enough to, you know, go all in on him last year with, with Gerald Everett coming back into the fold after the injury. But this year, he is a my guy due to the breakout potential combined with the fantasy draft value of picking him up as the tight end 12 in drafts after the 10th round. Let's start with the argument for, look, you know Gerald Everett's gone, so that's a piece of the puzzle, right? Sean McVay came out and said, hey, Tyler is the guy and going to be an intricate part of this offense. And that offense is changing. That offense has Matthew Stafford at quarterback. Everett's gone, but Josh Reynolds is gone. And Matthew Stafford is going to do more for the tight end position than Jared Goff does. In three out of the last four years in Detroit, Lions tight end saw more than 21% of the team's targets. It was Matthew Stafford on the other end of a lot of the Hawkinson breakout last year. This is a team that in Detroit, he had Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, Golden Tate for years. He had elite wide receiver options. He still involved the tight end position and gave them a large target share. So we've seen the the sample size that got people hot and bothered about Tyler Higby mm -hmm. two years ago. So we know that in a given stretch, he can 
go out and deliver elite tight end numbers. But what I like about him is when I look at tight ends and tight end breakouts, I'm not looking for PP, PPR hope. I'm looking for players that can do the George Kittle, Noah Fant, Mark Andrews, big playability. And even last year with Gerald Everett, he was in the top half in yards after the catch. He had the six most 20-plus yard receptions at the position. So you get big plays from Tyler Higby. So I'm really, really excited about the value and upside. I know, Jason, you're in the same boat. We've liked Higby since the the birth of the offseason. <laughs> Tyler Higby has been on our radar as, well, you know, this team is – it's his tight end room now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything at camp has looked outstanding. So I'm really excited about what he offers fantasy players who miss out on the, the Kelsey, Waller, Kittle. Just go Higby late like we did in the mock draft. Yeah, I mean the the I think some of the worst picks right now are the mid late tight ends who are all going to disappoint but take you away from taking a really valuable prospect at running back or wide receiver uh, when you're drafting a Dallas Goddard. It's a matter of value for Higby. I don't think any of us think Higby is going to be the number one tight end, but when it allows Higby, what he does is he lets the rest of your roster be great, and then he's better than some of the I mean, tight ends you bypass. What's the cost on Hawkinson right now? He is a fifth round. So I have a higher fantasy projection for Tyler Higby than TJ Hawkinson. Oh my. So like the end of year oh, fantasy oh, production is I have I just barely, but Whew. but he is higher. So if there if there's even a question that you believe that those two guys could be close together and you get one five rounds later, like you you said the cost on Hawkinson is probably prohibitive for you. Yeah. Uh, I, be, I, just because of the wide receivers you love in the fifth round. Yeah, it's it's true. I, I so that's think not he's the same be... for the wide receivers you love in the tenth. That is not the same for the wide receivers I love in the tenth. That is true. <laughs> All right, my second, my guy. I am so excited about this one. I I just think he is being completely disrespected because of emotions, and that is Clyde Edwards Hilaire. Oh, Wait, baby. is that your? Is he your Clyde guy? He's my, he's my Clyde guy. Uh, Chiefs running back coming into his rider, second year. Rider Clyde. Ryder Clyde. Okay. Okay. Clyde or die? Clyde or die? Clyde okay. or die. What about Clyde or Clyde? Hmm. <laughs> no? Oh, I, oh, Clydesdale. I, wait, I've, I, wait, I've got it. My guy. <laughs> My guy, Clyde Edwards Alaire. Let's go back to the first yeah. one. Uh, look, he's a very, very safe player, and I think he has an incredibly high ceiling. Here's a reminder of his rookie year sadness, disappointment, excruciating pain. He sucked, except not really. He had 1,100 yards, and mm -hmm. before he got injured in week 12, he was the RB11 through that time. He was just disappointing because people were taking him number four. In the Sleeper Bowl last year, at the number four spot, we had an argument between uh, Alvin Kamara and Clyde Edwards-Alaire. When you draft someone that high, and they're the running back 11, and then they get injured, you're just, oh, man, he's a complete disappointment. But his floor is as high as any player outside of the top five picks. But his ceiling is higher than most everyone's. And there are two main reasons that I love his ceiling. His ceiling to me is based on touchdowns and receptions. The touchdowns, well, look, he's safe, okay? He practically had none. He had four rushing touchdowns. So, like, maybe there's, well, I worry, maybe maybe uh, Daryl William meets into the goal line. So what? Who cares? He's Right now he's being <laughs> drafted as the running back 14. So he was the running back 11 last year with four rushing touchdowns through that stretch. So... But what if, just what if, I don't know, on this great offense, what if he scores like a league average touchdown rate? Uh, he had 43 touchdowns for every touchdown. He had 100 snaps per touchdown. That is horrifically bad. Low. Here's an example of how bad it was. He had nine carries inside the five-yard line. That is the exact same number as this four-pack of all-stars. Malcolm Brown, Peyton Barber, Leonard Fournette and Jordan Howard. Oh, Jordan Howard is unstoppable. That, that is the a, one. <laughs> yeah. They all had nine five zone attempts and they all turned them into four plus touchdowns. Four for everyone, five for Fournette. And Clyde Edwards Alaire had one. And do you guys remember why the Chiefs lost the Super Bowl? Patrick Mahomes sure does. <laughs> it's because their offensive line sucked. Yeah. I mean, they were terrible. And what did they do this offseason? They traded for Orlando Brown. They signed big money contract for Joe Tooney. They drafted Creed Humphrey. They're getting COVID opt-out Laurent du Duvernay-Tardif back. Their offensive line is one of the most approved in the league. So it, it's just better rushing lanes, better goal line opportunities. So I think he has the 
I, I believe he gets like seven rushing touchdowns, just a league average. I'm not talking 10, 12, and that will already catapult him up. So that's one reason. And the other reason is pass catching. He only had 36 receptions last year in his rookie season, and he is a pass catching specialist. He's not a guy like Josh Jacobs who was good at catching the ball in college. That was his trump card. That was his calling card. And it, I mean, he was a pass catching back, and of course, as a rookie, he wasn't used that much. 55 targets, 36 receptions. 55! Thank not you. letting you get away with that one. No, no, no. I wouldn't want to. Um, You're and, faster than me. You won that race. And the Chiefs beat reporters are saying that Clyde Edwards-Alaire has run more routes in the middle of the field, that he's got a more sophisticated route tree. I wanted to see what is the average back, not just for Clyde, but for Antonio Gibson, for Cam Akers of yesteryear and, and, and for the future. I want to see what is the average rookie running back who is fantasy relevant, what happens to their just normal target volume? I took a look at 458 rookies, and I narrowed them down to this criteria because I wanted them to be relevant and not too noisy. Just running backs who had at least 10 fantasy points a game, who played in at least 10 games, who had fewer than 80 targets. So they, they weren't Saquon Barkley, basically, rookie year. And of that group, 70% of them increased an average of 1.2 targets a year or a game. So 20 targets a year. So that's just the average. That's not to say they're great at catching the ball bad. That's just what happens from rookie year to sophomore year for running backs. And he's above average in that skill. So I think the fact that his targets could go up and his touchdowns could go up, he his ceiling is astronomical. He's a super young guy. He's 22 years old. You are 100% right with the emotional reaction to him because over the last 10 years, there have been 14 first-round running backs. Only three have... Rookies, you mean? Rookie running backs, sorry. 14 rookie first-round running backs. Only three of them have not delivered on ADP. And he was 15 spots lower than where he was drafted at the running back position. He was drafted, like you said. It was up at RB6 last year. He finished at 21. That is an emotional toll because for some, they're going to make a resignation. They're going to make a... Well, that just didn't work out. Like you, you didn't get Christian McCaffrey. You didn't get Saquon Barkley rookie year. You didn't even get Kareem Hunt's rookie year. You got a disappointing feeling week after week because you thought you draft him there. He's got to win you weeks, mm -hmm. and you didn't get week winning weeks. If he was a fifth round draft pick last year, he'd be in the first round this year. You'd go, you'd go, what a great rookie season he had, and he's on Patrick Mahomes' team, an upgraded offensive line. He's he's going to be great. But there's disappointment, and this is something I just found interesting. I found this last night. I I did not know this. So obviously he's very young. He's 21 years old as a rookie. He's still a full year younger than Najee. Uh, incoming that's, rookie. That's always so funny. I know. Still, still, and always will. Always be. will be. <laughs> but. Andy Reid has had a 21-year-old rookie running back before who played his entire rookie season as a 21-year-old who had exactly four rushing touchdowns. Oh, man. And had exactly 55 oh. targets. Oh. The same numbers. Thank you. Yes? Same one. <laughs> LaShawn McCoy's rookie season was four rushing touchdowns and 55 targets as a 21-year-old coming into his 22-year-old season. He goes to seven rushing touchdowns and 90 targets, finishes as the running back, too. That is the he just wasn't touchdown dependent last year. And so that, that's the most compelling argument to me is he, he didn't score. He was still fantasy relevant. If he scores, he could go nuclear. And he's at the 2-3 turn right now. He's the running back 14. Get Christian McCaffrey and Clyde Edwards-Alaire and then smash wide receivers. So Clyde or die this year? Uh, Clyde or die. <laughs> All right, Mike, you are back up. All right. My guy number two. This one... Uh, uh, Claypool, I don't think was a surprise. This one should not be a surprise I, either. Either? Uh, How do you guys say that? Either word? or either both work. What do you go with? Uh, I go either usually. I, Unless I want emphasis. If I want emphasis, it's either one. Okay. That's true. It's Tyler Lockett, wide receiver oh, from Lockett. the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, I was hanging out with my D&D &D crew last night, and they were asking me, like, have you are you to the point where like a Seahawk can be one of your my guys? I said I can neither confirm nor deny that. Neither confirm or deny. Yes. Ah man. <laughs> this is a situation oh, going so on tough. over here. Uh but in fact, a Seattle Seahawk is one of my my guys this year. It is Tyler Lockett. He is still a big part of this offense. They are committed to him, so committed to him they gave him a 4-year extension worth almost 70 million dollars. 
And it was a tale of two seasons, absolutely, for Tyler Lockett. But let's go back, let's paint the picture. In the last three years, he has seen his receptions and his targets rise every year. I think part of the what's interesting here for Tyler Lockett in, in the fifth round is he was a much later breakout than what you normally see. Like he he wasn't a second year breakout. He wasn't a third year breakout at the wide receiver position. It took him some time, but we've seen his receptions go from fifty seven to eighty two to one hundred. Tyler Lockett caught the ball one hundred times last year. He's had double digit touchdowns of two of his last three seasons, and it was eight touchdowns in that other season. He has the fifth most touchdowns of the last three years. Like Tyler Lockett is extremely good, and he's tied to Russell Wilson, who is a uh, high touchdown volume thrower. He saw more targets than DK Metcalf. Like It's not just DK Metcalf's team. Tyler Lockett is a huge part. This you is, have a question? Well, I, 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 it's interesting because you have been the table pounder for, like you, guys, you and Jason had the, the Russell Wilson debate. Like Right. Where, you know, the volatility of Russell Wilson. And Jason, you can speak as a former Tyler Lockett, my guy. Yes, mm -hmm. my um, guy two years in a row. So Just keeps providing value. Yeah, I mean, how was your experience with Tyler? It was outstanding the first half of the year. <laughs> so, yes, so but, but, but you're willing to overlook some of the volatility. Absolutely, because of where he is going in ADP. He saw 14 Enzo targets. That was tied with DK Metcalf. So it's not just him. It's not, it's not just Metcalf getting those end zone shots. He's going in the fifth round. He is your – He's an auto pick for you. Though. He is your fifth starter. He is not DK – everyone has no problem with the variance that hit DK Metcalf at the end of the season, but Tyler Lockett Yeah, has, have you seen how big he is? <laughs> it's, it's true. I like DK Metcalf. But Tyler Lockett is being punished all the way down to the fifth round. After week eight, that's when the consistency really took a turn for the worst. However, he was still seeing volume. This was just a product of maybe the defense figured things out. Maybe the, the variance was regressing to the mean. But in that time, after week eight, DK Metcalf seeing 26% of the targets. Tyler Lockett still seeing 23% of the targets. The volume was still there. It just, they were missing on the efficiency. T touchdown variance hit Tyler Lockett. David Moore had more touchdowns in that stretch. That's just how it goes sometimes. It did seem kind of impossible when you looked at the involvement in the offense for him to string that many weeks together yeah, where he, he did He wasn't going to keep doing it. It didn't really make sense. It was like, okay, if you just showed me the target share and the targets, you'd be like, okay, he scored this many fantasy points. But it just he just had a bad run. Yeah, and uh, similar to what Jason was saying about Clyde, if Clyde had done those things uh, with different expectations, he would be skyrocketing in ADP. If Tyler Lockett's season were flip-flopped and he started bad and then over the second half of the season uh, comes out strong and wins people fantasy championships, he would not be going in the fifth round. So with with everything, with the volume still being there, the efficiency will it will return, in my opinion. It's been there you know, forever. It, it, we have a crazy stat here. This one was dug up by the Borgogan. Over their last 312 targets, here's Tyler Lockett versus Devontae Adams. 239 receptions for Lockett, 220 for Adams. Over 3,000 yards for Tyler Lockett, 2,600 yards for Adams. And 28 touchdowns for Lockett, 25 for Devontae Adams. Like Tyler Lockett is not thought of as an elite wide receiver, and I'm not... He's being paid it, like one. It's, it's a fun stat. I'm not saying Tyler Lockett is Devontae Adams. That's just a fun cherry pick stat. But I'm saying that Tyler Lockett represents such an insane value in the fifth round. For how bad he was in the second half of the, of the year, he still finished the season in totality as a wide receiver one. That's how great the beginning was. So forgive the second half, get over it, and take that value in the fifth round. When you have that level of volume, consistency is an receptions. Consistency is an inconsistent metric. I brought this up in the past. We saw it with Michael Thomas, where – Two years in a row, he was incredibly full volume. You know, yes. he was one of the highest targeted guys. One of those seasons, he was very inconsistent. Like, he lost a bunch of weeks and he won a bunch of weeks. And then the next season, the most consistent wide receiver of all time. Just follow the volume. And Tyler Lockett has it, and he's got a great, great quarterback. I, he's my auto pick as well in the fifth round. So, really, it just comes down to when Mike and I are in a 
draft together. Yeah, who's who has the first fifth right. round pick? All right, my final my guy this year was recently quoted as saying, "I want to be a known name." Well, right now, Brooks, are we are we good on that trade? Oh, stop it! Oh, stop <laughs> it! Yeah, I just accept, accepted that. No, thank you, Brooks. You're hilarious. Uh, no, this this player wants to be a known name. I'm going to give him his day in the sun right now. His current average. His day in the night. Oh, I get it. Oh, yeah. It's oh, up. It's okay. full. I got you. Uh, he's being drafted as the wide receiver 50 right now in the 10th round. I'm 50. Darnell Mooney. Yeah, baby. Sec I guess we all have a second-year wide receiver on our list. Mine is the former fifth-round pick out of Tulane, Darnell Mooney, wide receiver for the Bears. A lot of people found it difficult to watch the Chicago Bears offense last year for good reason. The Guilty as charged. The quarterback situation was gross. But if you watched, there was a player, Darnell Mooney, that stood out with elite separation. He was constantly overthrown. But Darnell Mooney actually set the franchise record for receptions for the Chicago Bears last year as a rookie. He was fifth among rookie wide receivers in target share, seventh in total targets, ninth in fantasy points, and had the eighth most broken tackles by any wide receiver in football. That is a, those are absurd numbers for a player <laughs> that is – Mooney wasn't fantasy relevant. Mm -hmm. No. Not at all. No, he tried real hard to be, but the ball did not land near him. Ball does lie. Yeah, ball does lie. And this was like that rookie season was while acclimating to the NFL with Allen Robinson on the other side, fighting through atrociously bad rookie quarterback play. Um, and still, do you realize he had 98 targets? No. 98 what? targets as a rookie. You don't realize that because so many were not to him. <laughs> and he was on pace. Like, you know, you talk about. <laughs> we could have counted him for other guys. Right. The pass was so bad. They, were, they don't let us uh, credit the defender for the target. <laughs> Yeah, and you you know it's it's crazy because you know you talk about Jefferson. It took till game three, and then you talk about Claypool. It was till yeah. game three. Like over the second half of the year, his target pace was 120 for Darnell Mooney. The Anthony Miller experiment is over in Chicago, mm -hmm. and targets are one of those you know things that you earn as a wide receiver. It's a skill to demand targets in an offense. It's not random when you get up to almost 100 targets on the year, and you know, we looked at every wide receiver over the last decade that saw 95 plus targets as a rookie and what they did the year after. 90% of those guys had a top 36 season in their future. 76% of them had a top 24 season. So it is an indicator of a career arc that generally, you know, improves and doesn't decline. I think he's primed for a massive jump this year. He's virtually undrafted, so the risk for your team is almost nothing. He's an elite route runner. Um, he's been the standout. If you listen to Bears beat writers watching camp, uh, it's been, you know, like CeeDee Lamb in, in Dallas, it's been Darnell Mooney in Chicago. And so, you know, and this was a player that was 11th in deep targets last year. He just couldn't get the ball within the radius of where he was because of that, that quarterback play. So uh, if you go look at player profiler, 739 unrealized air yards. So he had the potential to actually be fantasy relevant last year. That was 10th in all of football. So I think that uh, this is an elite separator um, that just didn't have a bunch of catchable targets. I tried as hard as I could to scoop him up in a dynasty league from Brooks. I'm accepting offers now, Andy. Go get him. Like, that's the <laughs> message. Oh, gosh, Mike. <laughs> Maybe he should trade him to you. Maybe I have a better shot with me and you. But um, go scoop him up in Dynasty Leagues, grab him at the end of your drafts, and then get ready for Mooney to break out. I definitely think in a Dynasty League. I mean, with Allen Robinson on a contract year, but you know he's playing on the franchise tag, he could be gone. And the way this team talks about Mooney is you could see one of those, like, you know, the, the, those later round guys who end up shocking the team and then they're like well let's move on from our number one make him the number one that happens and i i could see that for mooney uh very easily so i i'm excited i'm excited for mooney 438 guy 95th percentile was speed. he i did not yeah. realize oh, he was yeah. 438 yeah, i mean a, i, I see it on the percentile. field yeah so wow. he's he's a uh, uh you can see you can see some tyreek you can see some antonio brown in the route running um 
And I'm not ashamed to make those comparisons with, with the ascension I think that's possible for him. Ooh, that's fire. <laughs> well, speaking of fire, are you okay? <laughs> My third and final pick speaking here. Of fire. Here's a fireball. Here's a fireball. <laughs> Brandon Ayuk, uh, wide receiver for the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, another second year wide receiver. We've talked that up a lot lately. Um, <laughs> it's funny. It, it, the you go back to that draft class, mm -hmm. you know, the two years ago, and that was the year that it was it, stash up. I mean, collect as many first round picks as you can for your rookie draft because these wide receivers we knew are it. going to come through in a big way. And now they're low. all, guess what? Now they're all second year players, so they're going to be even bigger. Yeah. Uh, lo and behold, it was a good draft class. Get these players. Um, Brandon Ayuk was great. In fact, I don't know if you remember this. Um, let's skip to the to the the love of that draft class. Um, John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan last year they talked about how. They had the 13th pick in the draft, and the day before the draft, they decided that if they can't move on from that pick, they're trying to trade down because they didn't have a lot of picks, that they were going to sit there and take Brandon Ayuk at number 13 overall. Reminder, wow. CeeDee Lamb went 17. That was their guy. They were able to trade back, and then later in the draft, they traded up from the 31 to the 25 to get their guy, Brandon Ayuk. That was someone targeted for this system, and what did he do his rookie year? He was awesome. He had he was a top 36 wide receiver as a rookie in only 12 games. He had 96 targets, 748 yards, five receiving touchdowns, two rushing touchdowns with 77 rushing yards, and he had five weeks as a top 12 wide receiver in fantasy. I know that he was missing George Kittle for some of those, Debo for some of those, but it doesn't matter. He still did it. Uh, that is more top 12 finishes than Justin Jefferson had last year. It's the same amount that Diggs and Ridley have. And over the last decade, you want to look at, you know, wide receiver one weekly finishes. You have only Odell Beckham who had more than Brandon Ayuk tied with Michael Thomas and AJ Brown. And then as a rookie, as a rookie, and then stupid Kelvin Benjamin again, <laughs> always ruining these <laughs> lists. Why'd you have such a good rookie year? You st st ah, I hate Kelvin Benjamin. You big tight end. You big you. tight end now. Um, but the point is, is that what he did on the NFL field was fantastic. The reports in camp are saying he has just been dominant, um, and he has. You, you, you watch uh, some of the, you know, the the normal Twitter highlights, and mm -hmm. you get all hot and bothered. And I think there's this question of, well, what about Debo Samuel? Debo Samuel was gone for a lot of the year. The splits with Debo and without Debo are almost identical. He he was just as good in games Debo played in and just as good when Debo was out. But people go, well, we don't know who's a better fantasy player this year for sure, so I'll just take the value. I'll take the guy who's going second. And I say no. There was some great studies done this, this offseason by uh, J.J. Zacharyson and Rich Rebar, two totally different ones, that found the same odds strongly favoring the fantasy production of the wide receiver drafted first when you've got multiple wide receivers going in those middle rounds. It actually found a really positive correlation where they beat their ADP. The first guy drafted does. Basically what it's saying is, look, we're smart. As a fantasy community, we get it. We peg the right guy. And usually, the guy who goes first beats his production by a wide margin, and the guy who goes second actually disappoints from that ADP. So I'm not worried about Debo Samuel in that sense. You have the draft capital of a first-rounder. They went up and got him while having uh, Debo on this team. And, and Debo is utilized in a completely different way than most wide receivers. He's a borderline running back. He, his average depth of target is 2.6 yards. That is, you know how Juju Smith-Schuster gets made fun of because everything's so close to the line of scrimmage? Yep. Juju's more than double that. He was, and Juju is, you know, 5.6 yards de depth of target. The middle of the field where normal wide receiver production is coming from, that is Debo's place to live. The connections in camp right now with both Jimmy Garoppolo and Trey Lance have been touted recently, talking about how he is the guy there. And, you know, the when I see a first-round NFL draft pick who had five top 12 performances as a rookie in only 12 games, and he finished as a top 36 wide receiver who's going in the sixth round and passes the eyeball test, that's a my guy. I'm going to take him in the sixth because I think that the risk 
doesn't matter that much. The upside is a true breakout, and uh, we've already seen it before. So I, I love I love Ayuk this year. Well, there's a connection between that my guy and potentially this next. There my guy. is, and the final one to this, reveal this final my guy. It's it, this could take some time. I'm calling this a stash and cash situation. It's Trey Lance, rookie quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. What he brings to the table is a truly difference-making, dynamic skill set with his legs. We've already seen the big arm. You saw it in preseason game one when he comes in and is like his third snap in the game. He just airs out an 80-yard touchdown, which, by the way, in that play, he bypassed the check down. He saw it was open, and then he said, like, no, I can make that throw. And he hit Sherfield right in the breadbasket, and it was a monster score. But the legs, we haven't seen it yet in in-game action, but you know what's going to happen. In it, Lance is an unproven talent, uh, really. I mean, it was it, the 49ers saw enough to make him the third overall pick. But his one year of big college production, Trey Lance, 2,800 yards, 28 passing touchdowns, zero interceptions, which is bananas. Also, he added 1,100 rushing yards and 14 rushing touchdowns. Also, bananas. He's built like a tank at the quarterback position. So let's yeah, but can I can I not like him? Because I'm a Cardinal fan. Yes, oh, that is a lot. Yes, yeah, very, very much so. Very much. I'm. I am dreading to having oh, to play against Trey Lance. Stupid NFC West. So let's look at what rushing has done for quarterbacks. Really prolific rushing quarterbacks. We've seen a quarterback hit a thousand yards three times. Lamar Jackson has done it twice. Quarterback one, quarterback six. Michael Vick did it once. Quarterback two. If you hit a thousand rushing yards which Trey Lance can do if that's – and the 1,000 yards is presuming the whole season. But the point is, if you come in, when, whenever you come in and you're on that pace, you're going to be an absolute stud. You have uh, you had Michael Vick in 2004, had over 900 rushing yards. He had 17 total touchdowns That's it that year. That's it. But because he had 900 rushing yards, he was a top 12 quarterback at the end of the year. Since the year 2010, so now we're getting into when does Trey Lance play? Since the year 2010, quarterbacks drafted as a top 10 pick in the NFL draft. We have 23 players, right? So we have 23 instances of a quarterback being drafted as a top 10 pick. 18 of those players started by week four. That is the vast majority of those guys. And then the guys who didn't, Trubisky, week five. Tua, week eight. Goff was week 11, and then Patrick Mahomes is – Patrick Mahomes and Jake Locker are uh, big outliers, right? They sat where, out. Where they, yeah, Mahomes was at the end of the year. Jake Locker didn't play until year two. But now let's move it up. Where was Trey Lance drafted? Top three. Not only was he a top three pick, San Francisco traded two future first-round picks to go up and get him. But uh, since 2010, quarterbacks drafted as a top three pick have averaged 13.7 games played per season. I firmly believe that Trey Lance will be starting sooner than later. We have we still have a scenario where by the season starting, Trey Lance is actually the guy week one. But even if he is not, I am drafting him in the 12th round where his ADP is right now. I am going to stash and I'm going to cash. Here's last year's. Is that 12th. a perma stash no matter how long it takes? Yeah, yeah, well, like maybe you get to week eight or something. I don't know. And what's your prediction but, right now on when he – like if you just had to – like. Put a stack of cash down on when if I he will to, get out there on the field. I'm I'm going to bet with the historical trends. I know every every instance is its own thing, absolutely. But I'm going to go with the history of the NFL, and I will say he'll be in before week five. Okay. With that 18 players of 23 making that start by then. Uh, and so here's here's why Trey Lance is such a good draft pick to me. Because if he once he becomes the starter, he's immediately a difference maker for your fantasy football team. Also, on top of that, he's going to be your second quarterback, and you are keeping him away from other teams getting that boost whenever he takes over. But look at the opportunity cost. Here's last year's 12th round picks. Reichwell Armstead, Duke Johnson, Sammy Watkins, Baker Mayfield, Golden Tate, Jarek McKinnon, Justin Tucker. The 12th round is just absolute garbage. There's I would no actually pass on a pick in the 12th if those <laughs> were my options. I would just say, no, thank I'd you. like to save this one for the waivers. Right. And that. That's basically what Trey Lance is. Trey Lance is a future waiver pick. 
but you are not burning your waiver priority. You are not uh, exploding 50% of your fab for Wentz, for one uh, when he becomes the starting quarterback. So I am all in on uh, draft Trey Lance at the end of your draft. It, yes, he's your second quarterback, and I don't often do that strategy. But when, I, when I've when i done that strategy, it's for these high, highly mobile quarterbacks like Lamar, uh, Josh Allen, back when they were nobodies, and then they became a fantasy force. And I think that that same upside exists for Trey Lance. Final question for you, Mike. Does that mean that you would probably be avoiding anything in the early quarterback realm regardless of value? Because obviously if you end, if you end up going Kyler in the fifth round, like – you're not replacing Kyler with the breakout of Lance later on. No, but I'm... So are you shooting for the Tannehill or the or somebody else later in the draft while you wait? Generally, that my strategy would be, but I don't... Even if I grab Kyler in the fifth or I get a value and I draft Kyler Murray in the sixth round, I'm still going to play the keep away because of be, being terrified that my opponent will get Trey Lance. All right. Tom Brady, Tyler Higby, Darnell Mooney, my three my guys. Jason has CeeDee Lamb. Clyde Edwards Alaire and Brandon Ayuk. And Mike is bringing Tyler Lockett, Chase Claypool, and Trey Lance to the table for 2021. Very excited to see how these play out. If you want to go on Twitter at the FF Ballers, share your My Guy with us. Use the hashtag My Guy, and we'll, uh, we'll browse some of those. Um, there are obviously a lot of players to choose from this year and a lot of excitement out there. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed this episode and you managed to get a few of these guys on your team. Brooks, you, you sure about those offers? Yeah, Because I was sure. really, I really wanted to come in here and say... Well, uh, now you can't. No, I you... went out and got Darnell Mooney. <laughs> you just yeah, pumped up his value. He sounds great, so I think I'll hang on to him. <laughs> there was a... I mean, that was strategic as well. I knew what was going on. So um, uh, Al wants to hear the offer. Why do you think that my offers stink? It was actually a, it, was, it was it was no, a strong. Were, I didn't say anything. Uh, the people I know what you're know. saying in your head. Uh, Will Fuller and Taysom Hill. Oh really? I didn't hear that. Last I heard, it was just Will Fuller. Well, technically, it was Will Fuller, Taysom Hill for Jordan Love, and um, oh, but I uh, I did I did offer like four or five other ones. He just doesn't like Will Fuller. That's going to be a problem for accepting a trade with Will yeah, Fuller. Yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Brooks, can I offer you Kadarius Tony? <laughs> No thanks. What first round pick, man? <laughs> but that, I the mean, limit it, it is Kadarius good to mention it, Tony, because I I think a lot of people on the surface would say they'd rather have Will Fuller, yes, than Darnell Mooney. But I had enough dynasty conviction to say like, I'm going to take the upside and the chance on Darnell Mooney, and I really don't know if their situations are very different. You know, with Waddle being drafted in Miami, with uh, the history that we have with some injury with Will Fuller, so and he's we, hurt right now too. Uh, that is true. It's a fair yeah. point. It's a fair point. Uh, I'm still waiting for that counter, though. All right. Next <laughs> week we got more. We got a review of preseason week two. We got breakouts, bus sleepers, values, and a final mock draft show next week. That'll do it for today. You can watch this episode YouTube.com/slash The Fantasy Footballers. Subscribe. Click the bell. We had the live stream yesterday, so we'd love you to join us on a future one of those. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.